Hey everybody, this is Hector with the Faith and Fandom Podcast, and this is an input episode. This is an episode where we are discussing the different uh, entertainment options, that uh, stuff that we're finding over the time that we're watching, reading, listening to, and enjoying on that note. So uh, just going to be hitting a few things uh, today. We're going to be talking about Star Wars and or. So joined at this time by Brendan Johnson, who is a... Uh, What's your not so I don't call you like a coach and say the wrong thing? What are what's your world? I am an athletic trainer. He's an athletic trainer, but as like he's a I grew up with Star Wars, Star Wars fan, but uh, over the pandemic, like many of us, uh, went down the rabbit hole of Clone Wars and Rebels and Mandalorian and all the other things. And so he's he's div, he's dived deep in the process, and so we're going to talk I'm about. Not, huh? I'm not mad. You're not no. mad. No, no, not at all. By the way, I got um, full Ahsoka costumes on clearance at GameStop for like five dollars. Like so I'm just, Halloween costumes. Yeah, so I'm just gonna wear the headpiece for because I can. Random days. He, he can't stop me. Hmm. Um, I would never try. <laughs> we should do that for like matching church days. Just like both go. I bought two. <laughs> of course you did. They're five dollars, man. Yeah. Um, so we should just we should do Sunday mornings with like Ahsoka head pieces. It'd be great. Um, but anyway. Togrutas? <laughs> huh? Is that their, their species? Togrutas? Dude, I've never. I've never even tried. Um, they're snipses. Um, snipses. <laughs> so this past weekend, um, uh, Ashley Eckstein, which is Ahsoka's voice, mm-hmm. and Rosario Dawson took a selfie together at a con. It was kind of great. It's a magical selfie. It is a magical selfie. <laughs> um, but Brendan, uh, I called Brendan over on his way home from work uh, because I was going to be doing the input and thought, uh, you know, <laughs> talking to my friend about Andor. So um, rather than me just ma- rambling, ram- rambling, rambling on about it. So um, overall, Andor, like, what's your big perception on it? How do you feel about it? I loved it. I thought it was some of the best. Not just live action Star Wars, but best Star Wars content to date. Now, uh, one of the guys uh, that we serve with and work with at our church, like he, he said he fell asleep. Donnie said he fell asleep in the first three episodes, and he said it was the worst Star Wars he'd ever seen. Now he's yeah, well, that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> he's he's gone back and watched it all. And he's like, oh yeah, that was good. Yes, um, you have but, to um, get the first. It, it it builds up slowly. Like you have to get. No spoilers, but you have to get through about the first five or six episodes before it really hooks you. Before that, it's just kind of bait dangling in front of you. So do you feel like that's why they dropped the first three at once? Yes. Because I don't, I don't feel like anybody would have made you just the first one and was like, oh man, I'm in. Yeah, I mean, I, I watched the first three. Like, I was on the road with work, and so I watched them back to back to back. Like, you should. Yeah. And we're going, okay. I'm interested, but that was about the the bulk of my experience at that point. So Star Wars, um, like for all the shows that have been released since, like we got into Clone Wars and everything else, my family's had a very strict schedule of by Thursday, we're all going to sit down and watch the new Star Wars together. No discussion. Um, like somewhere with Andor, my family's just like, eh, whatever. Shame on them. Shame on them. Um, but like, love you guys. <laughs> um, like I had, to, I watched it all by myself. Like, and my kids would walk in in the middle of an episode. Huh, and walk I out. could understand how it would lose a, a child's attention because it's there's not, a, it's not very flashy. It's not loud noises, and there's there's no lightsabers. There's no lightsabers, and. That's not a spoiler. If you don't know that by now, there are some kyber crystals. Attentions. Yes, there are, <laughs> but there are no lightsabers. Yes, um, but no, this is, and that's one of the things. This is very much a spy drama. Yes, that's a very good way of putting it. I called it a um, conspiracist thriller. Mm-hmm. Is how I yeah. describe it. Yeah, this it feels like something Brad Brad Meltzer would write. Um, I know that means nothing to you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But uh, as a as a comic book person and a novel person, it feels like something Brad Meltzer was right. But like overall, <clears throat> Sorry, Brad, 
Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> you might you would probably know him from the children's books before you knew him from the rest of the stuff. Okay. Um, he makes those. I am George Washington. I am Abraham oh, yeah. Lincoln. A little bit hit, like, but but he's also one of the best conspiracy spy thriller writers in the world. Um, I can get down with it. Huh? I can get down with I, it. I, I, you'd really like his stuff, but they haven't. Uh, outside of his children's work, they haven't turned any of his work into visual stuff yet. Outside of comics. So if they made shows or movies out of his stuff, I think you'd you'd breathe that in a heartbeat. Um, Sounds good. But uh, so I, I I that's the thing too of like a multi season prequel series to Rogue One. Yeah, we already know the ending. We already know the ending, and that that immediately ruins it for many people. Yeah, like we know we know what happens at the end of this story. Like, yeah. And then we know what happens at the end of that story that that follows that. Yeah. But some people just they need to embrace the suspension of disbelief, and you just need to let yourself like become immersed in the show, in the moment of what's going on. Yeah, I mean, when it's off and the credits roll, you're like, yeah, but we know what happens. Okay, well, who cares? Everybody knows what happens. <laughs> the writers knew what happened. The actors know what happened. Just. Just let yourself be brought along for the ride because that's the joy. That's the fun part. <laughs> but they all die on a beach. None of this matters. Well, right. just this thing like the the reality is like this was I, this is the first time outside of Rebels I feel that we have seen um, the full weight of what it looked like for the rebellion to really build up. Yeah. So I mean, I I remember. Growing up, and granted, you know, the first Star Wars movie, A New Hope, it came out in what, like, 77? 77. I was born in 88. So. See, I, I was born, and which is why. We had a whole trilogy by the time I got around to watching these movies. There is there's a subclass of generations called a Xennial. Yep. Um, which, basically, if you were born between episode two and episode three, or episode five and episode six. Yeah. So I was born a year after episode two. In two years before episode three, so I was still probably not comfortably potty trained <laughs> by the time Return of the Jedi came out. So. Yeah, but it—I just—I remember growing up, and that was the only Star Wars content that we had was four, five, and six for yeah. a long time. Yeah, and I was—I don't know. Whenever episode one, The Phantom Menace came out, 99. I was. Yeah, so I was 11. Like, I remember I was thinking, like, 10-ish. And I remember watching it and going, okay. But, like, so the the whole buildup of episode four, like, what what is the rebellion? What's the point? What is the empire? Where did they, like, I just, you just figure that they are an established galactic empire. And you don't, you don't know anything about how they were established, what they replaced. The, the whole ordeal from episode two all the way through to episode four We're like okay like it's Wait, a cool story bro we didn't get a good glimpse of that until clone wars and rebels right and more so at rebels and that's one of the things that i think makes andor more interesting is that andor takes place in the same time bracket as rebels yeah i don't know exactly because i don't know how far it is and i know that before i talk about this on the podcast maybe i should look it up Probably. Me. Someone will fact check us. Oh, if fact they check can. us in the comments. <laughs> um, but like, um, because the specter or the ghost, the ghost is, um, it's in Rogue One, right? But it's also in Rogue One after. Um, it's in Rogue One in the final, the final battle, the final and, and battle. And you see Chopper run across the screen, but I don't know if it's at the point where um, Kanan's still alive or not. Um. Because I feel like that's after that. I would I would say that's probably after because I feel like because they weren't quite a part of something bigger. No, they by were the never time part he of had passed away. Yeah, so, they were never part of anything that big. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, now towards obviously the end of Rebels, they started. Yeah. Like that's kind of where Rebels ends. Rebels kind of ends. Like big crap happens. <laughs> Kind of ends like I guess in my mind somewhere around Rogue One ish, 
Right, it does, and then they even go on to tell us that like Rex served in the Battle of Endor. Yeah. So Rex was there for Return of the Jedi. Yeah. So that famous little meme that. Yeah. Pops up. I don't know. That's a sad looking Rex. It is a sad looking Rex, but look at Rex at the end of Rebels. Yeah. Um, but the fact that you know we're getting this, we get to see the birth of the rebellion. Um, especially if you have you watched the um. A Jedi tale or whatever this. Okay. Like, you add that with... Yes. Also fantastic, by the way. Um, I felt like, man, this is a lot of Dooku. (laughs) It is. A lot of Dooku and no Dookie. Um, So it was... I mean, yeah. (laughs) So six episodes, three for Ahsoka and three for... Dooku. Dooku. And I still need more Dooku in my life. Yeah. Like, you read that novel about him, though. I did. You? I did. And it was really a novel about, um, what's her name? I can't think of it. The Assassin. Oh, uh, a solid uh, Ventress? Yes. Yeah. Um, finding out all this stuff about Dooku while on an assignment to find his sister. Okay. So, you you find all this stuff out, like, as you're, a, like, a fly on the wall or kind of more first-person point of view of Asajj Ventress, finding all this stuff out as she's doing all this other research, like, she's, quote-unquote, stumbled across this information, mm. even though it, it kind of seems like he, he left it out for her to find on purpose, but... Of course. Um, so, you, you... That kind of details, in a way, his fall from the order. I mean, that's what the book is called is the, the lost Jedi. Right. right. Yeah. So the lost Jedi, something like that. Fallen Jedi, lost Jedi, I think. But anyways, so really interesting because Dooku and Qui-Gon Jinn were very similar. Oh yeah. But well, cause Dooku, Dooku was Qui-Gon's master. Right. Yeah. But Dooku went one way. Partially because, and you started to see that in the Tales of the Jedi, because of Palpatine's influence, and Dooku went the opposite direction, which is a whole other rabbit hole Yeah, that we don't have enough time for. (laughs) Um, So, uh, what would you say was the best part of Andor for you? Oof. Um, I don't know. A couple things come to mind. The first thing that comes to mind is, I was, I mean, spoilers, I guess. Yes. Like, okay. Don't we- listen to this if you have not watched it. Go back and watch it. Um, for me, it was go watch thirteen episodes and then come right back. Yeah, uh, it won't take you that long. <laughs> uh, this probably won't even be edited by the oh, in the time night, that dude. someone can. It's going out at night, bro. What are you talking about? Um. Only thing I sleep on is a pillow. The the escape from from prison. Yeah. And it was uh the whole speech. So after they've kind of taken over the, the controls, I guess. Yeah. Um and Andy Circus's speech. Yeah, and he makes the whole speech about how there's one way out, and then you get to the end of the episode, the dude can't swim. And he knew that the whole time. He knew that the whole time. And so now thinking about it back, like thinking about it back, I just I imagine that he's the reason why he he repeats the phrase "one way out" so many times, and I don't think that he needs to convince the the inmates that there's only one way out. I think he needs to convince himself that there's only one way out because he knows the only way to get out is to jump off the prison into the ocean, essentially. Yeah, and so he's trying to lead this charge into death. And so the the phrase between the inmates is, we're already dead, right? We might as well try because we're already dead. We will die here. Yeah, nobody's going home. And so he's already dead. He's dead whether he stays or he's dead whether he leaves. So what was, I think it was Andor's, one of Andor's lines was, wouldn't you rather die doing something good or something like that? I don't yeah. know. Don't quote me. Yeah. So that was, that was the first one. And then the next one um, was the... The entire last episode, um, I just think was was genius. 
Oh, it was. And the fact that they used March's brick to just beat the freaking daylights out of some stormtroopers. I love it. Uh, that, I'm here for that. I all love day that long. it that he, they used Marta's brick, but also that it didn't break. Yeah, I was like, because that was the one thing I was like, I started to see that dude swing, and like I heard in my back of my mind, I'm like, please don't break her brick. Yeah, please don't break her brick. <laughs> Although I think if there was one thing that you that she could have asked for for her brick was not to be part of a wall, but to be part of someone's face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, those those were my two big highlights, and then obviously everything. Um, I think the whole prison sequence as a whole is just gold because I think it it highlights just the how evil the empire was. Yeah. Um the conversations that we got to kind of be a part of with like in the um the ISB's little staff meetings there. Yeah. I think that highlighted just how evil the empire was. Um and then all, on the flip side of that, we see some of that with Luthien when he sacrifices an entire 30, 30 men yeah. as part of the rebellion. And I'm always surprised like, when we get more Saw Gerrera. Because, like, you know, it's just like, oh, you know, we're done with that. Oh, look, there's some more of Saw. Because, um, like, I know, like, we got him early in Clone Wars. We mm-hmm. got him in, a lot of us met him first in Rogue One. Because I did. Yeah. Um, but he's in Clone Wars and all that stuff as well. And I think he's in Rebels, if I'm not mistaken, too. I have to go back and think. But, uh, like... Uh, well, he... Yeah. I mean, he, he he dies in Rogue One. Right, but he's in so, Rebels. So, I'm trying to remember if what I remember him from was Rebels or Clone Wars. I it, think of what I remember him was Clone Wars because Ahsoka was Ahsoka. Yeah. A cl- but in Clone Wars, he was just a skinny little soldier guy. Right, and, and when he, he wasn't was, the leader yet. Yeah, when he he's a leader at some point, I think too in Rebels, but yes. um, in the video game Jedi Fallen Order, which is part of the main story now, because mm-hmm. remember uh, that little square looking robot that shows up in a uh, Boba Fett, um, the end. It's like the next last episode. There's a little looks like a little square headed ro- robot on two feet. Um, he's one of he's the main droid. Uh, BD is the main droid from Jedi Fallen Order, but you get Saw Gerrera during Rogue One ish times in that game. Uh, but now you get a lot of Saw Gerrera, and I was just happy to see him back. But I, what the thing I loved about it is that it didn't hinge on him. Yeah, like I think it showed just how extreme he was. It's like the relationship. Like I know who you are. I know what you do. I don't want anything to do with you. Crap, we could really use you right now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing, like, you know, when, once we know somebody's name in Star Wars, we think it all kind of revolves around them. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the few times where you're like, oh, you literally are just another cog in the wheel. Yep. Um, and you added uh, Andy's speech, or Circus's speech, mm-hmm. in that I would say uh, Luthien's speech about, what do I sacrifice? Do I sacrifice? <laughs> yeah. My, yeah. my decency. Yeah. Peace, <laughs> like that whole thing. Yeah. That that was gold. That was good. That, that was that like was good. Like throw some Emmys at this man, and yeah. um, like I thought that was dope. Um, that was good. The the psychotic relationship between uh the blonde ISB oh, lady that's just gross. and the scrubs <laughs> and, and the corporate security it, dude and the corporate security like yeah. this like dude we, thieves keep thieves. Yeah, he's so weird. He's weird. The whole the whole time, <laughs> at the end, when they're in that little room, I'm just thinking to myself the whole time I was watching it, and Brandy was watching it with me. Um, she's watched like two episodes in passing when I watch them. Just, yeah. She didn't have any interest in, in starting. But anyways, though, I'm just saying out loud, and she's looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm just like, don't kiss, don't kiss, don't kiss, don't kiss, don't kiss, don't kiss. <laughs> Please don't kiss. That would be really, really, really weird. That's the thing. I don't know what would have been weirder. Them kissing her, her like him like getting stabbed i just like i don't know what would be appropriate at I this mean, point should have just shot him and what could have been done with it and the weird thing with him and cereal and like eating the cereal but also like when you think about this dude's literally trying to uncover the whole rebellion and he's getting crapped on by his mom every day yeah i'm because like he's not trying hard enough, at work. <laughs> trying hard enough. Yeah. <laughs> literally that's what that's what sparks the empire it's not it's not, you know, thirst for power. It's a nagging mom. Yeah. <laughs> Why did all those people nagging, die? Nagging mom and cereal and blue milk. Yeah, dude. 
Alderaan didn't die because of evil. Alderaan <laughs> died because of a nagging mom. <laughs> it's kind of one and the same. <laughs> um, so, uh, out, out of um, out of all of the Star Wars live action TV, where would you rank it? Ooh. Series. So we're. I mean, that's really we have Boba, Mando, Boba, Mando. We have. There's not really much. There's not a lot. There's not much more. So <laughs> top three. Um, <laughs> top three. Well, I mean, okay, um, throw throw in Rebels and Clone Wars. I I would say so. I think Clone Wars is important just because it fills in so much character context. Um, like that's the biggest thing I got from it. Seven, seven seasons. What seven times twenty? One hundred and forty episodes. Potentially, yeah. Ish yeah. of animated filler. Yeah. <laughs> Good filler. Oh, absolutely. But it, from having been someone who just watched episodes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever. Yeah. Um. Like I didn't know Ahsoka existed. I knew Ahsoka and, existed from cosplayers. And she's literally... The main thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. She's literally the fulcrum of the rebellion. Yeah. But I'm tired. But, so that, there's that. Plus, you get to see Anakin's struggles. Like, you just think that Anakin's just this dude who's just bad. But he's not. Like, he's just... he's a an angsty teenager yeah who is good at what he does i'm a, i'm actually who, writing a faith and fandom chapter right now about anakin's full gamut of story and the fact that you know you've got a slave kid who's never owned anything in his life never had anything of permanence in his life and then the few things he starts to grasp get keep getting taken away from him yeah. so of course he's going to live in deception rather than yeah. actually i mean anakin is a is one mace windu away from being like Luke Skywalker, really? Oh yeah. I mean, well, that's, no, no pun intended. I mean, that, he, he that's does. why. But like, that, he was like, if Mace just instead of saying, oh, "If what you've told me proves to be true, then you will have earned my trust," we just said, "Oh crap, that kind of makes sense. Let's go." Yeah. Then but, game over. That's why. If I, you probably might have seen this video floating around, but Dave Filoni, like all of that, the mm-hmm. guy who makes everything, um, everything good, everything. Shh. What? Um, <laughs> Uh, he stated that's why that scene in episode one is called the duel of fates. Mm-hmm. Cause it's not about who's going to win between Maul and the Jedi. It's about who's going to raise Anakin. Raise Anakin. Yeah. Because if Qui-Gon had raised Anakin. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Balance would have been restored to the force. We wouldn't have needed Luke and Leia. We wouldn't have needed popular movies. He would have been like, yeah. I'm a parent, this kid and we're going to love him. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, uh, uh, last question. What do you uh, want to see in Andor Season 2? Um, now, do you want it to go Andor Season 2, Rogue One? Or do you want it to have a couple seasons to build, then Rogue One? Well, I don't. and again, I don't know the timeline. For some reason, I have five years floating in my head between... I'm going to look it up. While between Andor Season 1 and... What is that, Scarif? Right? Rogue One? Yeah. Um... I have five years in my head for some reason. Uh, so if that's true, then I think we need two to three more seasons. But I think... Five years. Okay. So I think with how slow they've proceeded with season one, I think we need, if we keep that pace, because really I don't, I don't see a way that they speed it up. I mean, I think that would be like two different shows if they all of a sudden go from like season one long and drawn out to season two is bam, 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 bam. But I don't know. I feel like that would kind of ruin some of the magic in Andor is, is you get to see this building over time. Um, but so I, I guess my, the answer to my question is I, I would like to see one or two more seasons before Rogue One, like before the, the events of Rogue One. This is all just going to make Rogue One that much more painful to watch. Yeah, I watched um, Rogue One again. I, the season wasn't over yet. I want to say I had one or two more episodes left. And I watched Rogue One again because, you know, I had an hour and 45 minutes to do nothing. Um, 
and it was it's different. The first time I saw the droid coming to arrest him, and I was like, <gasps> K2SO. Yeah. Okay, and last thing I'm just going to throw out. Um, I freaking love that the droid's name in this series is B2 Emo. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's just B2 Emo. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> He is emo enough for everybody. Yeah. All right. So, so uh, Brendan, thanks for joining for this chunk of the podcast. And uh, appreciate your views on Andor and your just overall enthusiasm about Star I just, Wars. Yeah. Uh, I have very few things I get to nerd out about. And Star Wars, Pokemon, and that's really about it. And my job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Br- Brendan's a, a real world mogul, so he doesn't get to do too much nerd stuff. So. Yeah, that I only know what that is because you know you told me what that is. So. Yeah, <laughs> see, point exactly. <laughs> All right, we're going to continue on with some other stuff, but uh, once again, thanks for dropping by, Brendan. You're welcome. We're going to be talking about uh, the show Devil's Hour on Amazon. Going to be talking about Marvel Midnight Suns. Uh, going to be talking about Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Uh, also going to be talking about the Guardians of the Galaxy Christmas special as well as the musical Spirited and uh, the David Crowder Christmas album and the Switchfoot Christmas album. So those are some different things we're going to be talking about as we are going through uh, this episode today. So I hope you uh, enjoy some of what you hear. And if you've got some commentary on the stuff that we're talking about, please feel free to chime in in the comment section and uh let us know what you think about the stuff that we're talking about today so first off the show that we're going to be talking about uh, out the gate is the show the devil's hour on amazon prime uh i am a sucker for anything doctor who and uh this is a horror themed show i guess i don't even know if it's horror but it's it's a show called the devil's hour so I automatically think oh it's a horror show um but there it's a show called the devil's hour and uh, it's on Amazon Prime, free to watch. Um, but it stars Peter Capaldi uh, of Doctor Who fame and a million other things. But, you know, to me, he's the 12th Doctor. It also stars a, uh, I forgot the main actress's name, but she was one of the main ladies on Call the Midwife. Um, she also played on Doctor Who as well in an episode and um she's an extremely talented actress and she also starred in a movie about doctor who called an adventure in time and space about the creation of doctor who so uh there's a lot of doctor who vibes going on in this one series um but the the devil's hour is a six episode thriller uh about a woman who is having uh, deja vu esque flashbacks dealing with the future. So she's having deja vu about the future. And, uh, all this also ties into a serial killer by her understanding, uh, named Gideon Shepard, um, who is played by Peter Capaldi and Dr. Who. So this woman is constantly having flashes of murders and things like that. And she wakes up every day at three thirty three in the morning um she also has a son who is incredibly creepy now when i say this when we talk about creepy kids in movies and tv and stuff like that creepy kids oftentimes are like you know the the psychotic killers or mass murdering little kids and stuff like that this kid's just creepy he's not necessarily doing evil he's not like demonic or doing like demonish demon ish ish he's just creepy And, um, that, that's just the, the thing of it. And they're trying to figure that out. The show also, uh, features the actor who plays Jamie Tart and Ted Lasso in a dramatic ish role. Um, it's definitely a a departure from his portrayal of Jamie Tart. So it's nice to see him do something that isn't, uh, Ted Lasso. Um, but he plays the child's father and it stars a, also stars a young man who's a detective who's, you know, devil may care, I'm going to catch the bad guy type situation. So I'll say this with the devil's hour. I, every episode for the first three episodes, I had no freaking clue what was happening. I am very well versed when it comes to 
uh, predicting plots, understanding plot points, stuff like that. But The Devil's Hour on Amazon, uh, literally for the first three episodes, kept me guessing and kept me confused easily for half the series. Now, on the flip side, once you get past episode four, you start to have a very strong understanding of what's happening. You have to have a very, uh, like you have a solid grip on it, but I'll say this, it's not a grip you expect. Um, it is, it is disturbing as a show. It is psychologically confusing. It will give you chills at different points in times, but it's one of the shows that I can say is honestly one of the best contained shows all in one thing that hasn't left me completely disappointed. Um, so the devil's hour on Amazon, six episodes and, uh, it ends on a very, Oh snap. You got me vibe, uh, with how the show ends. And I don't want to add any major spoilers in case you do want to check out the show, but I'll say great performances by Peter Capaldi doing his thing. There's a lot of good stuff there with that. But what I did find out, uh, once the show is over, is that the show has very strong parallels to a specific episode of Doctor Who that also stars Peter Capaldi. And I won't tell you which one because it would kind of ruin it, but literally the entire premise of The Devil's Hour also syncs up with a very specific Peter Capaldi episode of Doctor Who, which... Recently, I saw a magazine article saying is one of the best episodes of Doctor Who ever made. So if that's something that interests you, if that's uh, something, if you want a psychological, uh, mental thriller uh, with a really great British cast, I highly recommend checking out The Devil's Hour on Amazon. And uh, for those of you who are listening, you might be like, not the devil. Um, it literally has nothing to do with the devil or demons or things like that. It's just that this lady wakes up at three in the morning every night, and that's considered the devil's hour. So uh, that is uh, something you can check out, something you might enjoy. Um, yeah, the devil's hour on Amazon, solid recommendation. Um, next, I'm going to jump over to the Guardians of the Galaxy Christmas special. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy Christmas Special was a delightful little piece of entertainment. And uh, it's our first look at the Guardians on their own again in a while. I know that if you watch Thor Love and Thunder, you got a little snippet of the Guardians, but just a little bit. And um, I feel like uh, you didn't get enough of them and they weren't in their own element with that. But this is the Guardians being the Guardians, and it's just really cool to see. Um, but it's, I mean, everything that you need to know about the Guardians Christmas special is right there in the trailer. Uh, the Guardians want to make Peter Quill not sad. So they decide to kidnap Kevin Bacon so they can give him a happy Christmas. Um, musical numbers ensue. Uh, Kevin Bacon has a musical number. Um, we get to see uh, a few uh, Guardians cameos and stuff like that but all the guardians are there you also get to see Groot's new uh form which is be the form he'll be using in guardians of the galaxy volume three and which is you know a little stockier not quite the previous Groot's form but you get the idea um and uh, but i'll say it's it's got some fun action it's got some fun uh, zany moments to it. It also has some honestly heartwarming stuff towards the end, but it also lays out a character plot point that a lot of people may have missed or just overlooked when it came to the previous uh, Guardians movie when it came to Ego. So uh, I also don't want to spoil that there, but if you are a fan of Guardians of the Galaxy or the Marvel Universe in general, and you have not yet checked out um, the Guardians Christmas special, I highly recommend you do that. Um, it's only 45 minutes. And a fun fact about the Guardians of the Galaxy Christmas special, though, is that the Guardians of the Galaxy Christmas special was filmed in the house of David Crowder, the home that is... Uh, supposed to be Kevin Bacon's home in the special is actually the musician David Crowder's house. He's uh, in an article in Relevant Magazine. He popped up to say that, you know, some scouts from Marvel showed up at his house and said, hey, we would like to uh, film something. They told him what it was. He loved it. And um, that actually led to him making his Christmas album. 
in a way, uh, since this house was already decorated for Christmas. So um, on that note, jumping right over to an audible uh, input, uh, David Crowder dropped a Christmas album called Milk and Cookies. Um, it's dope. It is it is hands down my favorite Christmas album uh, in a minute, probably since the Wren Collective Campfire Christmas. Um, it's uh, my favorite one with that. Uh, the Reliant K still kind of holds a very strong... Um, position as my favorite Christmas album, but uh, the uh, David Crowder Milk and Cookies Christmas album was dope. Couple high points of it. Um, it's got a song called um, Thanksgiver, which is like the first majorly um, published Thanksgiving song in a while that I've actually clicked with. Uh, there is a song called I've Heard About You. That is like saying, if all the stuff we hear about who Jesus is is real, uh, maybe it changes a lot of things. And so I really enjoyed uh, that album, and um, I would highly recommend it to anyone. Um, it's also got a what I would call a Christmas worship song called Your Praise Goes On. Um, so if if you like David Crowder, if you like Christmas... Um, if you like any of that, I, I really do recommend checking out the David Crowder Christmas album. Not only for those things, there's also a lot of fun stuff on it. There's a song for elves about elves demanding equal rights and being treated fairly, which has a strong Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire vibe. Um, there's also a song about how Mrs. Claus is sick of Santa's beard and wants him to shave. So it's, it's deep spiritually, but it's also deep entertainment wise. And on Christmas albums, while I'm talking about that, there is also um, Switchfoot dropped a Christmas album called uh, This Is Our Christmas Album. And honestly, it's okay. It is not bad. It is not as good as David Crowder's Christmas album. And I love Switchfoot, so I want to be like, yes, it's amazing. It is not bad, and it's not as good as David Crowder's Christmas album. But what I will say this, it has some gems. Um, one of my favorite... Um, Reliant K songs for Christmas is Merry, or Merry Christmas Here's to Me Anymore. It's kind of an emo song, kind of a Christmas song. Switchfoot has topped it with the most uh, emo Christmas song now. Uh, a song called Welcome or it's called My Midlife Christmas. So uh, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's about trying to find Christmas when you're in the age that I'm at of your midlife and everything. Um just kind of starts losing its magic. And so midlife Christmas, it's exactly that. It's beautiful. But I will say the highlight for me, and it's a stupid highlight, but the highlight for me of uh, the Switchfoot Christmas album is at the end of a track called Scrappy Little Christmas Tree, um, there's a strong bad reference. Um, one of my favorite Homestar Runner videos is one um, called Crying, where Homestar or where Strong Bad um, gets an email asking if he can make Homestar cry, and he says, "Oh yeah, I can make anybody cry. The strong of this little three little puppy or this one legged puppy called Little Brotto. and he he proceeds to show Homestar a drawing of a one legged puppy named Little Brother, and it makes him cry, and he's like, "Little Brotto, he's got such a strong one leg." You got the heart of a champion. And it's easily one of the Homestar videos my kids quote the most. Well, at the end of the song Scrappy Little Christmas Tree, there's some dialogue that you might not even think is worth turning your music up for. But if you turn it up, they're like, they start saying, Little Butto. And they start quoting the Little Brother Homestar video at the end of Scrappy Little Christmas Tree. So it was worth it to me to have the Switchfoot Christmas album just to get a new Homestar reference in my ears. So let's check that off. We did Devil's Hour. We did um, Crowder Christmas. We did Switchfoot Christmas. We did Guardians Christmas. And while we're on the Christmas vibe, let's go ahead and jump right over to the movie Spirited. Spirited is freaking gold. Spirited is a Christmas musical from the people who made The Greatest Showman, starring Will Ferrell and Ryan Reynolds. 
And most of us were exposed to what would become Spirited by a TikTok that dropped about a year and a half ago where Ryan Reynolds and Will Ferrell were doing the Grace Kelly challenge of the I could see brown, I could be blue, I could be violet sky. That whole video that they did, um, that was them filming the musical Spirited um, and them just goofing around in the process. Um, but that was just a, a big deal because it let us know they were making a Christmas musical together, or at least it let me know that. Um, but, uh, Spirited is an Apple plus original. It did release in theaters for a week before it went streaming. Um, but y'all, it's, it's a masterpiece. It's a modern Christmas masterpiece. It's hilarious. It's f- really just well written. It's f- it's just funny it's well acted the songs are fantastic it's um don't be surprised if there's not a faith in fandom chapter because the big the big heart pull from the whole musical is can we truly be redeemed and um without spoilers it also takes the classic story of a christmas carol and really really breathes some fresh life into the classic story of a christmas carol so as someone who did a Christmas Carol for like seven years of his life theatrically, like I've been Marley, I've been the ghost of Christmas present. I've, uh, I've, I've been all the roles except Scrooge. Um, this breathes the most life into the Christmas Carol as anything I've ever seen. I would put it right up there with uh, a Muppet Christmas Carol. And honestly, I would put it North of Scrooged. Um, which they actually reference in there. Um, If you're a fan of Elf, there's a joke about the movie Elf in there. Um, Casting's great. The the music really is great. There's a closing number called Ripples, the cut song, and the choreography. I mean, it's just fantastic. So if you moderately like Ryan Reynolds, if you moderately like Will Ferrell, if if you're a big fan of Octavia Spencer, you know, I don't know where you're at. um, This movie's great. Um, now the draw is it's on Apple plus or Apple TV plus. And I know that a lot of people don't have Apple TV plus a lot of people have no intention of getting Apple TV plus. So let me just tell you this, use your free trial for Apple TV plus, go ahead and watch spirited and do it before Christmas. Now, if you don't want to do it that way, cause I'm not a free trial user for the sake of just not avoiding pay y'all it's $6 to get Apple TV plus um, for a month. And I'll tell you this, this is for the people that listen to this podcast. Uh, if you get Apple TV plus for one month and it's $6 and you watch spirited and don't enjoy it, but let me add this. Let me add this because if you're getting Apple TV plus, you need to watch Ted Lasso. So (laughs) here's my, my handshake offer. If you get, Apple TV Plus, and you watch Spirited, and you watch Ted Lasso, and you don't think it was worth the $6, I will give you the $6. Come at me, bro. Word word is bond. I will, I will do it. But Spirited is wonderful, and Ted Lasso is a part of my soul, and I highly recommend uh, you check out both of those. Um, uh, I just for the sake of, I'm going to mention I'm involved in these, but I am not done with them. So I'm not going to talk about them yet. Um, the, uh, show Wednesday on Netflix, I'm like three or four episodes in with my family. It's great. Um, what I've seen, I'm not going to put a whole discussion on it yet just because I'm not there. Uh, just but throwing out there, I am watching it. Um, I am also on that same point with a book called the gospel for Enneagram, uh, for book or for Enneagram helpers or for Enneagram twos, which are the helpers. Um, I've only read the first two days of it and it's kicked me in the heart through the throat a few times. Um, I felt really seen. I felt really naked with it. Um, but it's really encouraged me spiritually and socially. Um, so, uh, Tyler Zach, who's a pastor, is right written this, and I'm really, really excited about it. Um, but it takes a lot out emotionally and spiritually when I'm reading it, so I'm taking a pace with it. Um, 
So those two are kind of just getting started on. They'll probably have a full review of those next go round. And um, on the same, I've started it, but I've not finished them uh, on Pokemon Scarlet. My kids are playing Pokemon Violet. Um, there were some complaints that all over the internet of like, oh, it's too glitchy. It's too buggy. Listen, 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 listen. <laughs> Pokemon Scarlet is delightful and it's fun, and it gives you an open-world Pokemon experience. And I'll say this, it's the most ambitious Pokemon game they've made. It doesn't just use Breath of the Wild's engine like uh, Arceus does. It creates a whole new world. And y'all, the Pokemon move in packs and stuff. Like, the first time I saw some Pyroars and Litten, or not Littens, but uh, Litleos, they're literally sleeping on the side of a mountain together. Um, I've seen some really new cool Pokemon, the creature you get to ride around on is dope. Um, I, I can just say this. I am personally having a blast with Pokemon Scarlet. I am on the last of the starting out gym leaders. I have one more, uh, team star, uh, base to take down and I maybe have another Titan to catch. I'm not totally sure. I think I've actually gotten all the Titans. Um, but that being said, y'all, don't let people who are just angry about games or who want to complain ruin games for you, okay? Just just don't do that. Um, enjoy it, and don't let other people tell you this. Now, I'm going to completely contradict myself and tell you not to play a game. You ready? Here we go. Uh, Marvel Midnight Suns. I pre-ordered it the minute I saw the trailer. Um, I un, I guess, un accidentally pre-ordered the Legendary Edition or whatever, the, the $100 edition of it. I ended up with a Chase Iron Man Funko Pop, which was super dope, actually. And I was pretty excited about the game. I get home. I load the game. And it takes like 20 minutes to get all the gigs of updates and data loaded in my xbox and all that and i start playing and y'all for all the trailers and all the cool graphics and all the idea of a demon possessed uh wolverine and spider-man and all that stuff it's a card game it's a card based turn game rpg where you literally shuffle a deck of cards and to play different moves and it's incredibly slow and it's boring and I was so disappointed in it and let me just say this I played it I played through the tutorial I got into the first mission I took it out of my Xbox I drove back to GameStop and got my money back um and they were like what are you doing and they're like, is it that bad? And I just kind of, I didn't want to be mean about it. I was just like, I, I, GameStop has this policy that if you return a new game within 48 hours, you can get a full refund. And I was there for my full refund. Um, I, the game spent longer downloading than I played it. It was the most, it was the most disappointing thing I've purchased as a video game. And I, let me say this. If I had downloaded this game as a free phone game, I would still be disappointed. Um, but the fact that Marvel was asking 70 or that, you know, the game developer was wanting 70 bucks for this game hurt my soul. And I was offended as a person. So I just told you, hey, don't hate on the Pokemon game because people have negative good criticism. And then I just took a steaming dump all over this game. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm complicated, <laughs> but man, it was the most disappointing game experience I've had. Um, and I'm sad that I even did it. It makes Marvel Ultimate Alliance three look like, um, the greatest game ever created is just how bad this game was. So I'll, I'm done pooping on this game's cornflakes. Um, but yeah, it, Marvel Midnight Suns is not the one. Yeah, for everybody that ever complained about Gotham Knights, I dare you, play Marvel Midnight Suns and think you have something to complain about. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> Woo! Um, on that note, on input, on working on giving y'all some input, I just released a new book uh, called Good News, which is a devotional of uh, 50 devotionals that I wrote for a newspaper. 
that's out now. I'm currently writing a chapter on Anakin Skywalker um, and his journey. I have a chapter planned for Spirited and I have some other stuff in the works as well. And I'm actually thinking now about going back and taking the Faith and Fandom 180s over the last two years and putting them into a daily devotional as well. So creating some more input uh, for you. And I can say that there are two comic book projects now that are actually moving forward. Like I've seen progress and it's really exciting. So that's a thing. Um, before I go though, I want to take a moment and thank our Patreon supporters. We have finished out. We have one show left for the year. Um, we have a show on December 17th at the Lumberton Mall. It'll be, you know, kind of a small show, but it's it's going to be a good time of talking with people. Also, just recently had a author spotlight thing in Fayetteville, and it was a really great event. Um, I was not going to do an entire uh, Artist Alley Aftermath for it um, because there are only three artists there, um, but it was really dope. Um, and I appreciate poetry in motion LJ for doing that. Uh, let me take a quick moment to thank our Patreon supporters, uh, Alicia Benson, Candace Davis, Jay Sheed, uh, Jillian, uh, Jason Crutchfield, Mike Perna, Todd Turner, John Jacobs, Zach Harris, Caleb Grimm, Jeanette Skaggs, Chris Poyer, Chris Cook, Jason Bullock, Christina Ray, Sarah Lewis, Patrick Gale, Rebecca Godlove, and Adam Davis. Thank you all so much for helping make faith and fandom possible. And I appreciate y'all. And.